Good morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? Good to see you this morning. I want to open up in prayer first. And, oh, there's a microphone. All right. Okay, let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. Uh, this is a holiday weekend. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, and Lord... We do want to keep in remembrance all those that have uh, fallen in the service of this country for the defending of this country and also for the defending of the freedoms that uh, we still have. And Lord, I believe that is ultimately through your grace, first and foremost. But Lord, we just want to uh, glorify you this morning. As we get together and uh, we partake in communion and uh, we get into your word this morning, we want to honor you. And not just with our lips, Lord, but with our hearts and minds this morning. So, Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just uh, open our hearts, that we would receive, that we could share, Lord, that we could just uh, express uh, the gratitude that we have for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord be with us this morning, and as always, Lord, I, I thank you for each and every family that's represented here. Lord, uh, may we uh, be able to leave this place this morning and know that you have visited. Lord, we just ask for a blessing on those that could not be here today. We know that there are some that are dealing with sickness. We also know, Lord, that some are vacationing. And uh, vacation is a good thing. So, Lord, we just ask blessings would be uh, poured out on your people this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, peace and blessings to you this morning. And uh, good to see Michael and Linda here. I know Linda's gone through some stuff. <laughs> uh, crazy. Yeah. Tomorrow 
is it's not about a mattress sale or buying a car or any of this other garbage you see on uh, the radio or TV or whatever. Um, it's about the fact that men and women have given their lives in that constitutional pursuit of happiness. And so that's what we celebrate. Um, yes, we'll be having cookouts and things of that nature, and that's a fun time to be around your family. But truth, truthfully, Memorial Day is a pretty somber event in, in all actuality. And so uh, I just uh, thank God for those that serve and have served, and uh, ultimately some of those have paid the ultimate price, and that's with their lives. So that's what we celebrate tomorrow. Um, next Saturday, the 4th of June, is the deputation service in, in Laporte. And I've talked to some of you through a message, and uh, some, of, some of you are going. I told they, uh, Pastor Kenny, who's the uh, pastor up there at Laporte, he had called me last week wanting a number. And I originally told him four, and then I sent him a message, and I said, we'll probably have six, maybe seven. And then, uh, uh, just so you guys know, I contacted uh, the board, and we're going to take a, an offering up to, to give to the Herndons. Um, and it's weird how it works, because you have to send it to Kansas City, and then they distribute it to the individual missionary, so... I don't know, something about keeping records, whatever it is. Um, I will be at a, uh, what would you call that, Beck? A, a, a renewing of vows for Jim and Sally Craig at 3 on Saturday. So I'm going to drive basically, what, is that Wheatfield? Yeah. Teft. I'll be driving directly from Teft to Laporte. So I've already sent a message to a handful that were, said they were interested in going. It's the address for the church. You literally just take Highway 39 straight up to Laporte, and once you get to that four-way stop, I'm trying to think, it's either the road before or after. It's called Ash Street, and the church is two blocks off Highway 39. When you take that left, you can't miss it. In fact, you can see it once you make the turn. So I will be there. I'm going to leave Teft about quarter after five, and that'll give me plenty of time to drive up to Laporte and uh, be part of that. So normally on something like this, we'd get together in a carpool, but I'm not going to be able to do that. I don't know if like, like you guys want to get together with some people and, and whoever wants to go, but that's coming up June 4th. That's a Saturday. Um, I'm trying to think. I think that's it. That's what I have. Um, isn't there a singing Sunday? Is it this coming up Sunday? It's the first Sunday, so the 5th. June 5th at Little Dove is uh, just like we had the singing here. They're rotating through the churches. Everybody's uh, welcome. And um, Ellie, you can go and sing if you want. We'll, we'll let you. Okay. Yeah. So that's coming up Sunday at 5 p.m. 5 p.m. June 5th at Little Dove. You guys know where Little Dove is? In Toto, the great metropolis of Toto. On Range Road. On Range Road, yep. All right. David and I will be singing in Warsaw Saturday, so we won't be able to go with you guys. But, gotcha. But uh, pray that that will be successful. It's been, okay. We've been a part of that ever since it started. It's a cancer. That's in Rochester? Yeah. In Warsaw. Oh, Warsaw. 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 And uh, we've always been a part of it, so we're going to go ahead and do it this year. Good. Pray it'll be a good turnout to help the person yeah. that they're doing it for this year. Gotcha. Gotcha. <coughs> All right. Um, no one did the month of dinner today. Yeah, no end of the month of dinner today. Yeah, there will be one for the month of June. All right. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to the crew up here. Good to see you guys this morning. Going to get warm today. Stay hydrated. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, I 
I'm going to ask for praises, but I'm going to give mine first because I have a big one. I have a couple, actually. Um, our son-in-law, Josh, was in a car accident um, last Wednesday. And uh, it totaled the truck, Katie's truck. She was just, she was very sad. She was worried about her husband. It was just, and he had just taken Brian to work. So Brian wasn't with him, but he had their dogs with him. They had two dogs. And uh, he was coming east on 10, and he was going to turn left onto a side road. And apparently, a person behind him was not paying attention. And he was going 60 in a 45 mile no zone, no brakes or anything, and it hit him straight on, just wow. rear ended him. He said it, it hit him, and then it spun him around twice and threw him in the ditch. So, wow. uh, but we're praising God because he was not seriously hurt, even though the truck is totaled. <laughs> but the guy had full coverage insurance, so that was a blessing. Um, and uh, when he hit the side of the truck, or the back of the truck, the side window blew out and Boomer got tossed out of the truck. And he ran off because of course he was probably hurt and scared. So we spent like four hours looking for him. We put it on Facebook and everybody was spreading it around for us and everything. And um, the, the guy from the tow place, he called and said that he was bringing the truck out. So we had to go back home uh, to meet him and deal with that. So, um, we got there and took care of all that, and uh, just as the tow truck guy was leaving, a lady called and said, I have your dog. Mm -hmm. So oh, praise yeah. God, and he was, he didn't have any broken bones. He had a uh, road rash on his, you know, on some of his body, and, and uh, he was pretty sore and, and scared. <laughs> but uh, the lady said, boy, he, he's a keeper. He said, she said she was working in her garden, and he just walked slowly up, and and went and laid on the rug on her porch. And she went over there and she said, I wasn't sure if he but you know, would bite or not. So she said, I kind of looked at him and I was talking to him and she said, he just kind of whimpered like, I need a friend right now. So she said, I just sat down and I petted him and talked to him. And, and uh, when Katie and Josh came up to get him, she said, uh, she, she knew he had been hurt because he wasn't moving around a lot. But she said, when Katie and Josh pulled in and, and, and he heard Katie's voice, so he, he jumped up and went, oh, my mom, Daddy's here. He was all excited. So they brought him home, and, and uh, he was pretty much uh, laying most of the day. But, I mean, he was pretty sore, but, but no broken bones. We're praising God. No internal injuries. And, and uh, Josh was not hurt. He said when the guy hit him, it hit, when he hit him in the back, it threw him back instead of forward. So he, and they have these big seats in the truck. So he said the seat took most of the impact so he had some red spots but the next day he wasn't even sore so wow. we're praising God for that because that was uh, quite a uh, I, 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 if you want to see a picture of the truck I got it on the phone did you see it <laughs> yeah it's kind of like an accordion <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it was uh, it was pretty uh, pretty crazy oh yeah yeah so and, and Boomer needs a seatbelt yeah, it does. <laughs> yes, yes. They like to ride in the back seat because then they can stick their heads out the window and see see everybody. But a car seat, yeah, a car seat. <laughs> but uh, so we're just praising God for all the blessings that came out of that trial because there were a lot. And uh, and also yesterday, uh, Tim and I went and spent some time with Marie and Alan. We had my girlfriend came up. Our girlfriend came up from Kansas, so we got to spend the whole day there with her and and uh, just visited, it was so nice and such a perfect day. I mean, it was a nice breeze, it wasn't too hot, and, and um, they had a lot going on at the campground, and then Marie's not here today, they had more people coming to, uh, today, and they got more tomorrow, and, but uh, I knew Alan was pretty wore out by the time we left, but uh, he does try to be a good host, but keep him in your prayers, because he is still getting uh, tired from the, uh, the treatments that he has, and he has to go back Tuesday for another one. So, just keep him in your prayers. But it was a really good weekend so far. So I'm just praising God for protection and for all of His blessings. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Do the, does uh, <laughs> does anyone else have a testimony? I have a praise report that Ooh. 
Lydia, so far, is going to be fine because we, we thought she was going to lose her baby. But, oh, but no. she's, uh, the numbers she's okay. went up, they doubled. So oh, good. She's, she's doing good. Anyone else? No. Any more prayer requests? Remember Paula. Paula, yeah. No, I think, well, we think that they've taken her to a middle hospital somewhere, so oh. uh, we haven't heard back, but we think we get called out the place where she stays, and she wouldn't answer, and so I knew that she's done that before, and we she had an episode that she had a problem with, and I think it just put her over the edge again. So pray for her. She's okay. And put uh, put Jerry Tolson down. That's Ray's cousin. Uh, he had taken a fall and uh, developed a, a brain bleed. And he has been in the hospital <coughs> for what a week already. Uh, at least a little. Yeah, over a week. little over a week. Um, <laughs> And uh, they think they had brought on a stroke because his left side is very weak. And speech therapy. And speech therapy, yeah. Uh, yes. Pray for uh, my brother Bobby. He had, he had a hernia operation. His one's got the four state cancer. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, had all kinds of different operations already. But pray for his wife. But she's, she's frail too. And also, uh, uh, no, my sister Mary, uh, pray for mostly you know, pray for her body, but she took a, the, she's in Chicago uh, hospital, and they took a lot of colon out of her, the colon of colon, and but they need salvation, both of them, their husband and her both. So pray for the salvation too, because, you know, and my daughter started to remember her for salvation, family members. Um, yes, I, uh, you guys know an awful lot about my family, <laughs> I already know that, but, um, my niece Sherry, who passed away two years ago, now, uh, and I told you that she practiced the Wicca and stuff, right? Yeah. Well, and she died of, uh, well, they had the COVID vaccine, and three days later, a blood clot killed her. And um, anyway, the man that she had been married to first, that she had her children with and stuff, he's a very mentally ill man and a um, uh, heavy drinker. Uh, he beat her. Um, he did other bad things, and anyway, recently, a couple months ago, he shot himself and killed himself. And so my two nieces from that marriage, from my my niece Sherry's daughters, they are both in really, really bad shape. Spiritually and I think mentally, and I know that um, I know that the oldest one, Rachel, is. She's told me herself she is a very heavy drinker and um, and that she's not doing very well. Now they both kind of hated their mother and father. They don't even call them mom and dad. They they call them by their name. Well, and they inherited both of their life insurance policies, you know, and so they have, they got a really good inheritance and stuff, so, um, but I don't think this has been a particularly good thing, honestly, you know, I mean, they're both, they both got good jobs, good jobs anyway, and all that stuff, and my, the, Rachel has been, she's been spending so much. She sent me stuff from Bath and Body Works and just, I mean, tried to be so nice, you know, to me, mm -hmm. which is, that's lovely. But what I'm worried about is that she is, they're both very agnostic, almost to the point of atheism, 
which that came from that, you know, the way they were raised, you know, and everything. And it just hurts my heart so bad. These are good girls and sweet girls. They just don't have Christ. So that is the biggest, you know, yeah. thing I want you to pray for. for and those it was girls. Rachel and Rachel. Rachel and Karen. Karen. And uh, they are, they're precious in God's sight. And right. I know that they just need the right, you know, they just need the right person and the right time to, you know. Yeah. And, and I, I just prayed for that so hard, and, and I would like for you to pray for that with me. Okay. Uh, we'd also like prayer for um, Ray's um, brother, Mike, his uh, son-in-law, Randy Berger. Berger. <coughs> He's very ill. Randy Berger. Yes. Yeah, Brenda, my uh, great nieces went over and beat uh, my brother's girlfriend brother, up the night. Well, she's pretty bad in the hospital. Let's so pray for that incident. There's a lot of bad feelings in our family right now going on. I mean, just pray for that. Who was she's it? She's not uh, my, my brother's girlfriend. She's in the hospital. What, do you know her name? I don't know her name, but I just know she was beat up pretty bad. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, is there anyone else? This is on our right to Cheyenne and Trina. They're going to be going to Kentucky for their dad's memorial. They like to gather down there. But they're driving, so just remember for safe. My daughter and my daughter, Trina, and for safe travels. Okay. Okay. Is that it? I need prayer for medical issues. Okay. I have to go see another specialist. Okay. I get tired of doctors. <laughs> Oh, and I have an eye injection on Thursday. And I got to say, I actually, I went to my doctor and I asked her for some anti-anxiety uh, pills just to take before I have that done. It's getting, it's really getting hard for me. Yes, Thursday. Okay. Okay. Pray for uh, Arlie and also Wayne. They both they both got allergies or something because they got the pollen's all over because uh, our our woods is full of pine trees. Everything is yellow. <laughs> all the pollen's coming out of uh, the, the trees and stuff. But they went home and I, I guess they did season and cough not cough but season and drain and stuff and they're, they're feeling real bad because I think it's it's I think it's because of the pollen and stuff. So pray for them. They're not going to be here today because they're both under the weather so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, do we have any birthdays or anniversaries coming up this week? We do not. No birthdays? No birthdays and no anniversaries. Right now we have one of June's June's fourth, I think. But they're not here, but they're not here. <laughs> okay, uh, we are going to take communion. So we want you to join us. Uh, we're going to need some ushers. sacrament of communion. You have commanded uh, your disciples, your followers, to partake of this. And so, Lord, uh, as we approach this sacrament, we don't want anything between ourselves and you. So, Lord, uh, we take time this morning and we, we lift up our burdens to you. Lord, uh, Lord, if there be anything that besets us from being able to take this communion. Your servant Paul said, some take it unworthily. And Lord, we don't want to do that this morning. Yes. So Lord, we're praying and asking that uh, you would, uh, as we examine our hearts, Lord, that uh, grace and mercy and forgiveness would be in the midst. 
And Lord, we want to take it, uh, as we say, Lord, to our, our soul's comfort. The Lord himself ordained this holy sacrament. He commanded his disciples to partake of the bread and wine, emblems of his broken body and shed blood. This is his table, and the feast is for his disciples. Let all those who have with true repentance forsaken their sins and have believed in Christ unto salvation, let them draw near and take these emblems, and by faith partake of the life of Jesus Christ, to your soul's comfort and joy. Amen? Amen. Let us remember that it is the memorial of the death and the passion of our Lord, also a token of his coming again. Amen? Amen. Let us not forget that we are one at one table with the Lord. Amen. Amen. We are reminded that in the same night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. As we lift the wafer that represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you and I, it preserves us blameless unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Thank you, Jesus. As we lift the cup, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, there it is again, folks, preserves you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to partake in this sacrament. And Lord, we know that you are active and working in our lives. And Lord, we're just thankful this morning that you grant us the accessibility to partake. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll take up God's tithes and offerings. No, no? we're not after. doing that yet. After. Yeah. After. After. after we sing. Oh, after we sing? After oh, we sing. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, my bad. Because we need Becky. See? Uh -huh. oh, gotcha, oh, that's gotcha. right. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Stand if you can. Praise the Lord.
sing a song that we <laughs> we we have um, lived this I guess you would say and the rest of you have too Yeah. 
just a little bit ago. Tell you what, Ellie, Ken's never going to be gone. Because I saw Tyler back in the back doing what Ken used to do. <laughs> speaks to me is James doesn't pull any punches. He tells you how it is. And uh, if you know his story, if you know James' story, then you know that uh, um, there's a reason why he doesn't pull any punches. And so if you could please, could you stand with me as we read verses... Uh, 1 through 5 in the first chapter of the book of James. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, and knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. You may be seated. Well, we can go, we can go down that chapter a long ways, but we're going to focus. Whoops. Encore, encore. Uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon said that trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and they let us see what we are made of. Now, how many of you like a challenge? Anyone here like a challenge? I guess it depends on what it is. Right? I'm not necessarily talking going from a 500-piece puzzle to a 1,000-piece puzzle. <laughs> I'm talking a challenge. Um, you guys know I like to fish, and I do use a lot of lures. And maybe it's a little bit of self-pride, but it just tickles me when I can convince a fish to grab onto a crankbait in the river. I feel like I've tricked him, which I have, right? Um, and so... Artificials for me make it more of a challenge because, uh, I mean, what fish doesn't want a wiggle and worm or a minnow, right? So when you use uh, artificial baits for me, that's, that's I feel like I'm uh, putting a little more challenge into the game, if you will. But, uh, yeah, Charles Spurgeon said that uh, our, these trials teach us uh, what we are. We're going to get into that, and James is really hitting on that. But I want you to think this morning about present-day circumstances. Think about, uh, we see societal degradation, right? Society seems to be going wacky. And the truth is, it's always been wacky. The church has always been counterculture to what the world's doing, right? But today, with all our technology and the way we, that we can transfer and transmit communications and, and the things that we see, we see more of the bad stuff than probably what we would normally see if you went back 30, 40 years ago. But now everyone has a camera and things are recorded and uh, even the littlest stuff uh, we see. And think about the immoral thoughts and the practices that we see going on, and not just in the United States, but in the world. Um, guess what? 
This is going to be a shocker to you. But these things have always existed in the world. There's always been people that have been fighting against the, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are, there's always been this level of paganism in the world. It's, it, it's existed. And then we get to worry and anxiety. Some of our worry and our anxiety is because of the societal situation. Some of our worrying and anxiety is from the, we see these people with immoral thoughts and practices and the things that they do, the sin that we see abounding. And it seems like there's no reining it in at times when we watch the news or, you know, catch something on Facebook or other types of social media and we're like, what in the world is going on? Where is God? What is He doing? Well, then we get to the book of James. And I want to share some things with you about the book of James. In fact, uh, I, uh, when we get to the end, I want to share something. It's a little bit of a historical note about James that I, that I found. And uh, you'll be surprised at how James was perceived in the first century. So we get to the book of James. James is the half-brother of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, many Bible scholars believe that he was not even a believer until after the resurrection and the ascension. Some people think, no, that he, he was aware of what was going on. But think about this. Have any of you had a brother or sister that was the wonder child? Right? They could do no wrong. They seem to be the favorite. Well, what about James growing up with Jesus? How do you handle that? What do you do? He saw his resurrected body. And yet, in that first verse of, that we read, he says, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. What kind of pride do you have to push out of your way, out of your heart, that you can call Jesus Lord when you grew up with Him as your half-brother? And what about the church? We know that James headed up the church. The apostles gave him the authority to handle the church in Jerusalem, which was a very big church. But, as we read those scriptures... James says, count it all joy when you fall into these trials. And we're going to get into that word fall because there's a specific meaning in that. But I want you to think about the church. See, in Jerusalem, the Jews, the hierarchy of the Jews, they thought they got rid of Jesus. And they thought that this group of men that was called the way, that they were just going to fizzle out. But see, they didn't. We get to the day of Pentecost and Peter preaches his sermon and everyone hears it and look, the gift of tongues is of God now on that day of Pentecost the blessing was in the hearing everyone heard Peter in their own language and guess what happened thousands were added the church grew. All this stuff was taking place. Here you go, James. You handled the church in Jerusalem. Well, guess what happened, which we don't read. This is why James can pull no punches, and he can say, count it all joy. The Jewish Christians, guess what? When Before they were Christians, they could go to the synagogue, and the widows and the orphans, they could get help. But once they became followers of Christ, the synagogue denied them access to food, to help. This is the church that James was in charge of. He led that church in Jerusalem. It was the first century. It was primarily a Jewish church. They were seen as blasphemers for not following the law. And what they didn't understand is that Jesus made it very clear in his earthly ministry. He goes, I didn't come to get rid of the law. I came to fulfill the law. There was no help. There was no offerings. There was no charity. 
from the synagogue. And you weren't going to get any help from the Romans. Right? So, jump around here a little bit. We read in Paul's letters that he is going to all the churches he started. And what is he doing? He is taking up an offering for the church in Jerusalem. It's estimated it was five to 15,000 people that were Christians at the time James was there. Can you imagine? No help, no food, uh, no justice. And the Apostle Paul, who was sent to the Gentiles, is taking up an offering for the church in Jerusalem. See, we need to rightly divide the word. We need to take the whole counsel of God. Now it makes sense why Paul was taking up the offering. Because the church in Jerusalem was huge, but it was suffering from persecution. It was suffering from trials. And so, like I said, you get to verse 1, and he says, I'm a servant of God, a bond servant of God, and also to the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, the, now there's humility. Now the pride's out of the way. Now there's an acceptance, and he understands, and the, uh, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ has been opened to James' eyes. And then we get to verse 2. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. When you fall. Now, the words there, the English doesn't do it justice. The words mean when it comes upon you. It's not planned at all. What James is saying is when these trials are thrust upon you, when you fall, I don't believe in falling into temptation. You're lured in. You don't fall into sin. It's a conscious decision. Now there is the sin of omission, but that's still, that is still a conscious decision. It is personal. Sin is personal. When you fall, James says, when it's thrust upon you, and you don't know what to do, when you wake up to a situation, when you get that phone call from your parents or your children, in the middle of the night, when you arrive home from work and you think you can rest, but you come home to chaos. And some of you are saying, I'd, I'd just rather go back to work. <laughs> what about when you go to work and the whole place is almost a dumpster fire because there's stuff going everywhere? I know a couple of you understand that. <laughs> And you're like, I just want to go home. Because the trials seem overwhelming at the time. Notice that James doesn't say, if you fall into a various trial. See, there's some false teachings and beliefs in the church that uh, we will not have trials. I've shared with you guys before. That evangelist that stood up, remember that great big brown wooden pulpit we had? You guys remember that thing? Yeah. We kept it forever because some church might need it. <laughs> I'm glad. We should have had a ceremony <laughs> getting rid of that dude. It sat back there forever. But the Word of God was preached from that pulpit. Yeah. He doesn't say, if you fall into them. And there's this falsehood that we tell ourselves, that we take the scriptures and we manipulate them to make us feel good. And we say, well, God loves me, so I'm never going to face anything. Well, that evangelist told me that when I became a Christian, I would never have any more problems. And he lied to me because I still had problems. Now, eternal salvation, that was Jesus. And he took care of that. James doesn't say if you fall into a trial. He's saying when you fall. You ready for the, the clincher here? You're all going to have trials. How, has anyone here never had a trial? I'm just curious. Okay. We're all in good company then. You will have trials. Ask James. Ask Martin Luther. Ask the underground church all over the world if they don't have trials. It takes place. The children of God will have trials. But James, through the inspiration of the Spirit, is telling us, count it all joy. Well, James, you don't know what I'm going through. I 
think he does. Sometimes we even think that with our Lord. We're like, Lord, I don't understand. Do you know what's happening to me? Do you know what's taking place? And the truth of the matter is Jesus says, yeah, I do. I do. See, count it all joy. And we're going to see it's an equation. James is telling us this equation. Count it all joy. When you fall, not if you fall, when you fall. Brothers and sisters, we're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulations. It's going to take place. Then we get to verse 3. And it says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. How many of you want patience and you want it now? <laughs> right? That word in there. See, the English is, God help us, and I'm glad the Holy Spirit reads on the Bible 24-7. Knowing. What James is telling the people is you should know. You need to know that the testing of your faith produces patience. He's not saying, well, you need, to, you need to figure this out. He's talking to the 12 tribes that are scattered. He's saying, you should know that the testing of your faith produces patience. How many times have we said, well, I just don't have the patience for that. Well, I just don't have the patience for that. Oh, you're trying my patience. Right? James is saying, you know or you should know that the testing of your faith produces patience. And guess what? You want to be a patient person, you're going to go through some trials. That's how it happens. And it's a testing of our faith. Why do we test things? Think about this. Let's take it off of a, a spiritual aspect. Why do corporations that build things, why do they put their motors and stuff, and why do they put them together and they put them in these boxes and they run them for 100 hours straight or 7 weeks or whatever? Why do they do that? What about simple things? Like, I learned a long time ago, if you want to know your oil for frying is hot enough, take the handle of your wood spoon and stick it down in there. And if it bubbles, it's, it's hot enough. I thought that was the coolest thing ever at the time. I was like, wow. You know, I was one of those that was taking a drop of water and phew, waiting for it to pop. Why do we test things? We test them to see if they're real. We test them to see if they're authentic. And guess what? God allows the trials to come. We're allowed to be tested to see if our faith is real. If it's authentic. And it's not just for the purpose of God, but it's the purpose for your faith as you express it to your children, to your spouse, to the people you work with. There's a bunch of people in this world they are like, I don't understand these Christians. All this is going on and they're at peace. They don't understand it. Why do we test things? See if they're satisfactory. To see if they're authentic. Think about this. Back in the early, not the early centuries, let's go back to the 1700s, even the 1800s, 1500s, 1600s. They used to make copies of the coins. They were wood. You ever seen in a movie where they take the coin and they bite it? That's to see if it's real, because people used to counterfeit coins back then. They would make them out of wooden slugs. And that's what they bit the coin for. Why did they do that? They tested to see if it was authentic. What about diamonds? Why do they hold that little glass up there and they hold that diamond? And they're looking for a certain amount of fractures in the diamond, because it's, it's God made all the gemstones geometric. And they're going to have certain cracks and certain fractures in them in certain places. Why do they do that? To make sure it's genuine. And what about our food? Got that container of coleslaw in the fridge? And you're thinking, ah, eh, three, four days. What do you do? <laughs> yeah. Why are you testing your food? Because <laughs> you want to know if it's satisfactory. Yes. Right? And so it is with the testing of our faith. The testing of our faith will let you know, get this, will let you know 
what is real, what you believe. We learn from messages from preachers. We learn as children from Sunday school and VBS. We learn from our parents. We learn from special camps, church camps and stuff like that. We learn from Bible studies. We learn and we test it. Think about this. The testing of your faith will let you know what you believe. Ready for this? It'll also let you know what you pretend to believe. See, the Bible makes it clear. And I'm going to bring this up, and hopefully this doesn't ruffle any feathers. But we all, we have pre-trib, we have mid-trib, we have post-trib. And they all can be found in a certain group of scriptures for each thought process of what it's going to be like for the return of Christ and the end of times. But the truth of the matter is, only God knows when He's sending His Son. The thing that we were told as Christians is, watch for these things and know that it's coming. It doesn't say plan for it. It doesn't say this one over that one. Now, I'm probably with the rest of you, and I would like Jesus to come and take me out of here before it gets really crazy. Amen. Amen. I mean, that's our, to be honest, that's our human nature. We don't want to be a part of that. We don't want to have any part of that. And yet, Jesus says that these things will happen, and then the Son of Man will come. So, but what I'm saying is this is, this is what the testing of our faith does. It allows us to know what's real, what we've grasped, what God has done in our hearts and our minds. But it also exposes what we pretend to be true, what we pretend to believe, and what we have learned. So the testing of our faith brings this outcome. If you want to grow in your faith, you have to face some testing. All of them did it. Jacob. Jacob. His name meant to deceive. He stole the birthright. And then he was on the run. Because Esau at the beginning was surely going to kill him. But guess what? Through that process of running, what happened? God blessed him. God actually also blessed Esau. And then there, there was this coming together. I talk about it all, all the time. King David, he fell. Some of it was his own doing, but he did fall into some various trials, like when he was anointed by the prophet to be the next king, and then he's on the run. He didn't ask to hide in caves. He didn't ask for the Philistines to come after him, after him. He didn't ask Saul to start chucking spears at him when he was in the temple. He didn't ask for any of that. But would, have king, would King David have been the king that he was if he wouldn't have gone through these trials? You want to be great men and women of faith? Then your faith is going to be tested. It's going to be tested. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, wait a minute. James says, count it all joy. Well, he's telling us. The testing of your faith brings this perseverance. It brings this patience. It brings this uh, resolve that we have in our, in our Christian walk. This is what we have. James is saying that the test will show that our faith is legit. I want to have great faith, but I don't want the trial. Well, according to God's word, that's not how that happens. And see, our faith is ultimately a response to God. That's what it is. Confidence in his word, confidence in his promises, brings us to a point of connecting with him. I want you to think about this. Patience equals persevering. It really does. To persevere. But in order to persevere, you've got to go through these things. Can we allow the trial that God is allowing to come? Can we allow it to come to completion? I've known many of you many years, and I've known your struggles, and you've known ours, and the things that we've gone through. And the amazing thing to me 
is that you're still walking in faith. And it's through these trials that you're doing it. You've seen, you've tasted that the Lord is good. You've, you've held on to the promises, even when the times were hard. And you've held on, and your faith has been tried, it has been tested, and you are still here. Amen. It's to be perfect. Verse 4, let patience have its perfect work. Let the trial, as I said, that God is allowing to do its completion, to be perfect, to be complete. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't say, woe is me. It's easy. You know, that's the easiest thing we can do is have a pity party for ourselves. That's the easiest thing we can do. We can shut down. We can say, I'm not going to do it. Well, I want to share two truths with you. The first is this. What we are praying to be relieved from is the very thing that God is using to expand our faith. Now, we do have an enemy, and I believe that he will try to attack us. But do you trust God? Do you trust God to, to hold you and to keep you? We just sang a song about it. In Christ alone. One of the scariest things for us as human beings is facing death. And yet in that song, I love that verse. No fear of death. And I've always said this jokingly, but there's some truth to it. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm a little afraid of the process. But I'm not afraid of dying. Or as the late Bob Harrington would say, I'm not afraid of dying, I'm just not in a hurry. Right? The second truth is this. Our trials cause us to seek God's face. And we pray. And we interact. And we trust. And so we look at what's going on in our personal lives. We look at what's going on in our, let's just say, in our school systems, our local government, our federal government. We see the stuff going on. We see society. It seemingly is breaking down. And God says, trust me. That's what he says. Trust me. But you don't understand. Yes, he does understand. But I don't want to do this. You ever have a kid, one of your kids tell you, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do my homework. I don't want to do this. I got a funny story. I probably told you because I always repeat my stories anyhow. My dad and my uncle were teenagers. And they were my grandpa. He was pretty stern. If he told you, he told you once, and that was it. Right? He said, boys, one of you's got to take that garbage out to the road. It was a little 13-gallon kitchen, and my dad and my uncle argued whose turn it was to take the 13-gallon white trash bag out. And so my grandfather turned to them both and says, I want you both to put a hand on each side of it, and you're both going to carry it out to the road. Well, now, this is a pride issue, because who wants, they don't want the neighbors to see two somewhat almost adult young men carrying one little 13-gallon trash can on each side. And so, my dad says, I told Grandpa that I would just do it. He goes, no, we're too late for that. You both take it out there. So they had to walk this 13-gallon trash can, one hand on each side. Our trials are there for a purpose. Do we have to like them? No. But James says, count it all joy. And he tells us why. Because it's going to expand our faith. And that's how we have to look at it. And James is the leader of a church that is suffering. And James doesn't pull the punches. He says, count it all joy. You're scattered abroad, you 12 tribes. Count it all joy. You new Christians, that your family disowns you, count it all joy. You old Christians, your family won't talk to you, count it all joy. That's what he says. He goes on in that verse 4 and he says that you may be perfect and complete. That perfect, the word they used there is to be mature. To be mature and to be lacking nothing. If you're complete, you are lacking nothing. You want to know why 
You see these saints of God, these prayer warriors that we've known for years and years, and it seems like nothing phases them. Well, they have mastered through the power of the Holy Spirit to count it all joy when the trials come. And they can only do that through Jesus Christ. It's the only way it can be done. You can't do this on your own. I want to look at verse 5. Because in verse 4 it says, complete lacking nothing. Now my father-in-law used to say, what's left after all? Nothing. Nothing. So when James, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That means you, there's nothing that you need. Nothing at all. And then he gets to verse 5 because the readers of his letter are like us, lacking nothing. Well, I could use this, and I could use this, and I could use this. James understands he has to clarify here. He says, if any of you, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. You ever thought about that? There's a lot of stuff we can do, and the Holy Spirit kind of gives us a spanking over it. But the one thing that the Holy Spirit will never give you a spanking over, according to the Word of God right here in the book of James, is that if you're asking God for wisdom, <coughs> wisdom with your family, with your spouse, with your job, wisdom with your relationships, wisdom with what the kind of work that you do, right there, the Word of God says, He will give it to you liberally and without reproach. That's amazing to me. Because sometimes we think, well, the reality is, unless Jesus is in our life, we're not worthy. But sometimes we approach the throne as being unworthy. You were saved by grace. That's what we have. Who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, I didn't add verse 6 here, but we're going to read the first part of it. But let him ask in faith with no wavering, with no doubting. Sometimes the very fact that we're asking God for things, whether it be something spiritually, supernatural, like I just need peace in my life. Lord, I need this anxiety to go away. Lord, I need to quit worrying about stuff. Lord, I'm, I'm concerned about this. Or it could be the simplest things. Like, Lord, where did I put my glasses? Come on now. No, you can't tell me none of you have asked the Lord to help you find simple things. I can't be the only one. But you ask in faith. Let's, I mean, let's, let's flesh this out. I, Becky can testify. I know I put this here. I know I did. Where are all my tools? Why can't I find my screwdriver? Where did my digital multimeter go? I had it right here. Well, the truth of the matter is, no, I did not have it right there. And there's so many times that I'm like, Lord, I just had this. Help me find it. And I find it. Amen. And some people will say, well, that's just you searching around. No, I'd rather give God the glory. Amen. I'd rather give Him the glory in that. And so as we face this, right... Think about the trials. Think about the things that took place. We're going to celebrate Memorial Day tomorrow. Think about those trials that those men and women faced. Think about the stuff that they went through. Count it all joy, brothers and sisters. I know, I can tell some of you still aren't convinced. <laughs> Count it all joy. I'm so glad I get to go through this. James is telling us, big picture. Realize as a son or daughter of the living God through the power of the Holy Spirit that as you go through this thing, that God is with you. Amen. And He's going to bring you through it. Amen. And then your faith expands. Now I want to read to you real quick. says, James, the brother of the Lord, received the church from the apostles. He was called the just 
from the Lord's time even to our own. This is a, a record from uh, given about James from, a, uh, boy, I'm going to butcher this name, Hegesippus. <coughs> Hegesippus, first century writer. And he says uh, he was called James the Righteous because there were so many people named James. He Now listen to this. This is some stuff I found out. This man was holy from his mother's womb. He drank no wine or no strong drink, nor did he eat anything that lives. No razor came upon his head, nor did he anoint himself with oil or use the bath. Think about that. Right? Um, he only was allowed to enter into the holy place, for he... Uh, never wore woolen clothes but linen garments only and he was uh, he wanted he wanted to go alone alone into the sanctuary and he used to be found prostrate on his knees asking forgiveness of the people so that his knees grew hard and worn like a camel's knees because he was ever kneeling and worshiping God and asking forgiveness of the people and on an account of his exceedingly righteousness, he was called James the Righteous or James the Just. Now, this is going to sound familiar, but it's about his death. And when many were fully persuaded and were glorifying God for the testimony of James and saying, Hosanna to the Son of David... Then again, the same scribes and Pharisees said one to another, We did ill in giving scope for such a testimony to Jesus, but let us go up and cast him down, talking about James, that they may fear and not believe. And they cried out, saying, Ho, oh, even the righteous is gone astray. And they fulfilled the scripture that is written in Isaiah, Let us make way, make a way with the righteous, for he is displeasing to us. Therefore, shall they eat of the fruit of their works. And we get to here, and it says that they grabbed James the righteous, and they began to stone him. For when he was cast down, he did not die at once, but he turned and fell upon his knees, saying, O Lord God our Father, forgive them, I beseech thee, for they know not what they do. Who else said that? Jesus Christ. And James the head of the church of Jerusalem was stoned to death for being a praying man. Brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you fall into trials. Count it all joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I don't want anyone to leave without having a clear heart and mind this morning. Lord, as we approach your throne of grace and we have partaken of the sacrament, Lord, surely we don't want to be unworthy in that. But Lord, we would be lying if we didn't say we were concerned about our world and what's going on. And yet your servant James, who went through so many trials, tells us, count it all joy. So Lord, I ask for every individual here Holy Spirit, do a new work in each and every one of us. And Lord, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, I ask and pray that they would come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, woo their hearts as you have wooed ours. And Lord, we're just thankful that we can worship this morning, that we can share our testimonies and our prayers. Lord, you have been so good to us. You have shown grace and mercy to us. You have shown the, the, the very love that our souls needed. And I thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, I lift up our prayer requests this morning. And Lord, I ask that you be uh, mindful of us. And Lord, I know, according to your word, that you are already working in these requests. Lord, we're so thankful see the families here that we see. We know that many are traveling and, and, and having family functions, Lord. And, and Lord, I, uh, I'm just thankful that uh, you love us so much 
You have made a way for us. And Lord, let us not forget that we can count it all joy because you died on the cross. Let us never forget that, Lord. Lord, I ask and pray that as we leave this building, that we would be a light, that we would speak life to those that we meet. Lord, this weekend we may meet people we only see once a year. So Lord, let us be ambassadors for you to them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all.